Okay. All right. So for this video, I'm going to be interviewing Jim Peacock, um, a band director. Um, would you like to describe your experience for everyone listening? Sure, sure. Uh, I've been teaching uh, for about 18 years now uh, at the middle school level, primarily, um, both in Texas, in the Dallas area, um, in San Antonio area, and now in my hometown of uh, Madison, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. uh, and besides teaching middle school, I also have about a 10 to 12 member uh, trumpet studio full time um, when I'm not teaching. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you, you doing this and spending your time here. Um, so the first thing, you know, before we get into this um, is a question about why is a civil discussion on these topics of trumpet pedagogy? Why do you think these things are often so hard to, to come by? Because I think um, like we will have a very, you know, a good discussion that we you know, we highly respect each other. It's very respectful. Oftentimes these um, issues get pretty contested. So um, what would be one thing that you would say, one reason why you'd say that oftentimes these discussions turn the way they do? Well, if I were to say you know, one reason, I, I think there's several mm -hmm. on the table with this, but I think the main reason is people are hesitant to change or have fear of change. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they like what works for them. Mm -hmm. It may produce great results. It may produce mediocre, but a lot of people I think are just afraid to try new things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one thing, I mean, it comes from a lot of different angles. I think, you know, if you tell someone they're wrong, I don't really like to do that because <laughs> first right. of all, I don't think the truth is always so black and white. Sometimes there's multiple variables and, you know. Yeah. Especially yeah. when it comes to trumpet playing. Especially when it comes to trumpet playing. Right. right. Like, you know, sometimes we get into talking about what words we use for students, like certain words. And there's certain words I might not use for students but that doesn't necessarily make them wrong. It just might mean that the way that the information gets, you know, processed in someone's brain, you know, might. Right. So, right. Right. so yeah, that's just to bring up a point about, you know, these discussions tend to get heated, <laughs> but we will say very respectful. Um, and yeah, one more thing, I think that not every, I think that um, oftentimes people don't um, agree completely, even when they agree on most things. So I think it's, it's, I don't think I've ever met, you know, um, a few people who, you know, agree on everything with this. Oftentimes you come to a fork in the road where, and that's fine. It's fine. Right. But, all right. So a couple of years ago, we did a consulting session mm -hmm. um, that was on, on teaching beginner trumpet. So could you just, describe your experience with that uh with the session mm -hmm. well i had heard it i think it was on facebook i heard uh videos of your students mm -hmm. uh playing i can't remember if it was solos or ensemble material but it was it was what i want for my students to sound like mm -hmm. and even though i've been playing since 1991 a long time you know i was like wow this guy he's really got these kids playing well i want to hear what he has to say because mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm open to new ideas. I think I've talked before, like I've done everything under the sun. I've tried all kinds of teaching tricks and, and tips, whatever. Anybody who has a good section, I want to, hey, let's see what you do. So I wanted to reach out to you and see what it was. And I had no idea uh, the, the background you had, but on our conversation, it was very cordial to very well. And you present information very clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was able to go the next week the next day and apply that to my classes and you would say it worked pretty well it worked yeah it worked really well and i'm i'm really pleased to hear like i think uh, we've talked in the past like the people i work with say that the trumpet section the people i started your method with are now ninth graders awesome and and they can say wow you know they the trumpet section is really consistent mm -hmm. across the board you know different levels of technique different levels of reading ability but you know, as far as their sound concept goes, it's very, very consistent. And I'm noticing that now too with my, uh, with my beginners, seventh graders and eighth graders, it's yeah. very consistent in each group. Awesome. Yeah. Um, when I started this, I think, you know, I was right out of college and maybe, you know, some people thought I was a little bit too young to know what I was doing. Um, but where I really got this was I studied a video um, of a, a teacher who was in his eighties, my teacher's teacher. And mm -hmm. I went and applied this in my, you know, last year of college and 
film that it works. So yeah, I just come up with these ideas on my own. I <laughs> also get this. So to review for the audience members, I'm going to list a few of the ideas that I cover in this channel. Um, so um, we're guiding the sound as opposed to focusing on making the face look correct. Like there is an approach. Um, I think it's often done where um, a textbook trumpet embouchure is what most people have in mind. And then first we try to make it look this way and for it to be correct. Um, but the approach we're going with here is we're more guiding the sound. And yeah, we place the mouthpiece. It's not like we don't place the mouthpiece. <laughs> we do yeah. that part, but then oftentimes this stuff forms naturally on its own. And then forming sound production on the lead pipe as opposed to the mouthpiece in the beginning. And then we get into certain kinds of exercises we use with students. And the main philosophy is focusing on the sound, not so much the mechanics. So for those who aren't familiar with it. Wow. Um, so the lead pipe, when you started using this, what were the um, results you got in your beginner class? Well, it made it very apparent about how much airspeed they were using and how much how much resonance they produced mm -hmm. in the mouthpiece is i love using the mouthpiece um from a from a beginner standpoint of initial vibrations mm -hmm. uh, you know it, it gives you an idea of more of like an x-ray to me i think of the mouthpiece like an x-ray vision into what's going on like i can hear subtleties but the lead pipe amplifies that mm -hmm. And I, I think that when you have the students play on the lead pipe, they think it's silly at first, but they get that, they start hearing the differences in their sound. You can hear the tension or flabbiness in their tone. And, and it's really easy for them to hear resonance early, mm -hmm. as opposed to beginner trumpet. Having the whole mechanism together is less to focus on at first. You're focusing on the vibration and the sound rather than hand position here what am i doing with the angles it's it's very simplified it's very simple right and that's that's kind of the point of it would you say that when your students are able to start to get a sound on the lead pipe then you see that you go to the trumpet and it's like wow they have a sound it's there yeah. did you see it really helps the sound hatch did you find that in your experience Yes, it does. And it helps to reinforce that with some older students too. But with the beginners, the I had a mixed group this year. I have about half cornets, half trumpets. So I yeah. haven't been able to do it as much as I would like to. Um, but with the trumpet students, the ones that start on the lead pipe this year are very free. They have a free blowing sound. It's very effortless. You know, there's a lot, of le lot less mm -hmm. work it's taken to guide them into the correct sound. My cornet players are a little bit different this year. Yeah, the cornet, um, I found it works, but it often, it makes it, you know, a little bit more complicated with the class, but, and then the embouchure. So we talked about the approach of focusing on the sound with the mm -hmm. embouchure. So did you find that this approach works where you, fo where you focus on the sound? Yes. Instead uh, of really, you know, hyper focusing on how, what the embouchure looks like. Right. Yeah. And, I, and I, I've done, I've, I've used your approach and I've used the other approach in the past before too, or really focus on, on the look first. Mm -hmm. And it, it's one of those with me, this is how I work. It's over, it's a paralysis by over analysis, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so when I get too much in the detail of how it looks, it tends to make their sound not as, as, as vibrant. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the past couple of years, I focused on getting their faces to look in the ballpark, more of a call response, you know, yeah, you know they, they'll have a mirror. Uh, I'll say, look like me and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll make my arm sure and they'll make it back and mm -hmm. look like me, look in your mirror, look at me, you know, do it. And if I can get them close, yeah, you know, cause I'm watching for, I'm watching for things. Cause I had to do, I have to talk a little bit about it. Cause I don't know them. I have to make sure things don't pop out that are weird and, <laughs> you know, Cupid's bows, that kind of thing. But, um, but if I get them in the ballpark, it's really helped. And I, I, I don't address it as much because yeah. I'm talking about how big is your sound? Do you sound like me? Do you sound like, like I have a really, my first chair girl in sixth grade, she's going to be a beast. She has a, a huge sound. It's great. Yeah. You know, she's like a high school kid already. So it's like, do you sound like her? Are you listening to what it sounds like? Can you copy that? You know? So it's, it's a great feeling. And that's what I found when I started using this. Mm -hmm. um, when you see start, when you see all these students start to sound really good and it really, I think it happens consistently. Um, I, 
so that that's why I found it work because I was doing this and it seemed like it happened consistently. So if we were to bring up this idea of at first we're not you know obsessed with what the embouchure looks like, and there are some traits of a successful embouchure, a textbook embouchure, that you know some people would say is completely necessary. Right. Um, there's maybe an assumption that if you don't adjust these things, the class is going to be a free for all. It's just going to be a sloppy. And you would say that it, it's not that in reality. Right. It, it's, it's not. Well, I would say that you, you would have to address them. It's in, it's how you approach it. Mm -hmm. um, with the beginners, you, I think you want to make them feel successful. Mm -hmm. You know, at first, Hey, you got a sound. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. You, you let a sound happen. You didn't force it. That's great. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I tend to, I can, cause I'm on block schedule. And mm -hmm. so I can, I can, I'm used to taking two steps forward, one step back every class. Mm -hmm. And so it's more of a gradual, Hey, let's, let's focus on this. Now I think, remember those cheeks that were puffing out, let's try to keep them focused and let the air, let the air flow freely and keep yeah. those cheeks in, you know, so it's a gradual mental note taking of what the students are doing and trying to ease them into the proper set. Would you say oftentimes when you see the sounds start to come about, then you start to see the traits of a textbook embouchure? Mm -hmm. I have one student in particular that happened this past month. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, he started off well, mm -hmm. um, and then he got quarantined mm -hmm. uh, and he was out for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And even though we had lessons and he was submitting his work, I, I couldn't, our district, we didn't have, we could not do a virtual face to face online. We had to just, he had to submit work and through audio to me. And so when he came back, his cheeks were puffing a lot and we were working on going back to that sound idea to get the sound free and vibrant. And then his cheeks gradually now don't puff anymore mm -hmm. and his sound is improved. Mm -hmm. His range is improved and he was doing some weird angles at home. And now that's all back where it is, but it all comes back to what do you sound like? Mm -hmm. And you would say that once you start to see the students sound really good, then, you know, as a teacher, you know what a, a textbook embouchure looks like. And then you look yeah. at it and you're like, wow, the, the corners are forming and that's, that's starting to work. Right. I yeah. think that a lot of people are really skeptical of that idea that, mm -hmm. you know, and I can understand why, because it seems like, I mean, if this would be the first year doing it, you might be intimidated thinking, you know, I've, I've gotten people who they, they seem really intimidated by the idea of that. Ooh, that wouldn't work or I've never seen that done. And well, yeah. And, and I understand cause that's how I was taught to in college and first started teaching is you get this set, then you can make the sound where in reality it can, it can be, it depends, it depends on the teacher. I would say it depends on the teacher, but for me, it works best where I get it in the ballpark. And then I can find and guide them to the sound. And then the errors, the, the little bitty nuances work themselves out. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned in college, you know, how we were all taught. Um, would you say that these ideas are represented in college tech classes most of the time? Well, you know, I, in, in my college class, you know, we, I had a great teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I did too. He worked great. He, he was really focused. Um, Kind of along the same lines he 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 was focusing on good repetitions mm -hmm. you know, sound and and not getting into the details but mm -hmm. does it sound good or not well if it does then keep doing it mm -hmm. you know uh but when it came to brass methods class for, for the music education majors it was very textbook this is the embouchure describe the embouchure form the embouchure and kind of over over detailed that is that is exactly what i'm talking about so what I find right. interesting is that, you know, this is a school of pedagogy, mm -hmm. and you know, Arnold Jacobs and Adam, you know, for trumpet. And what, what seems really interesting is that, you know, a teacher might go into the world and have never seen, heard of these ideas wow. <laughs> that there's people, right? So I, I find it interesting that it's a major school pedagogy, though in these tech classes, it, it seems like, I don't think these ideas always get talked about, it seems like. Would you say right. well, most well, of the all the people you've known, would you say that, I mean, a lot of them have seen it in their tech classes or do you think it would be more rare to see it? Well, I think, I think those of us who are trumpet players that are band directors, mm -hmm. uh, most of my friends I can think of that went to their colleges, they had great trumpet professors mm -hmm. that taught them these ideas. Yep. So I think that, and, and they're the ones whose clinics I go to or if I hear their classes mm -hmm. play, they're the ones who are talking the same way is the yeah. sound guides the mm -hmm. action. 
Yep. No guys the action. So interesting. So um, you mentioned that your brass players were doing really well with range. You told me the one year with your beginner class. Mm -hmm. So we use some of those expanding exercises and those expanding long tones. Mm -hmm. so could you describe maybe how what we did helped with range or did it help with range? It, um, Why? Uh, well, with with the brass, I'll start with um, with the trumpets. Mm -hmm. I've really found that the descending slurs, mm -hmm. starting on a gradually higher partials and using a descending pattern, has helped them become more confident mm -hmm. in their range. There's something about it where if I play a C, a third space C, G, and low C, and they buzz it back on a mouthpiece, the mouthpiece is less threatening than the trumpet at mm -hmm. first, and so they're matching the pitch, following mm -hmm. my, following my pattern. And then they'll try it, and they'll, they're just, I'm not talking about mm -hmm. faster air, smaller aperture. I'm not mentioning mechanics at all. I'm mm -hmm. playing with them and showing them how it sounds. They, they listen to me, mm -hmm. sound like me, you know, and they, they can match, and they can, they can manipulate the armature with the mouthpiece. That's why I start with that first. And then they just match the horn, and it's a lot more free-blowing. It's less harsh. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're ascending, you're talking about? Yeah, then if I'm ascending, right. I'm descending yeah. is that more relaxed Starting, feel. Yeah, with that. that. That's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. So yes. you, sound, you found with the beginners, if you start by going down. Mm -hmm. it worked, and it's worked with all of them. Uh, it's worked great with tubas. It's worked mm -hmm. great with the French horns as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is a very consistent class. Mm -hmm. You know, with my trumpets, with, we started a school a month behind. Um, due to, to COVID, uh, but they're all producing uh, one octave range nice. and that descending pattern. Nice. I mean, all of them. And yeah. you know, and it's a and it's a good sound. It's a sound I would want in in my bands. So yeah, so it sounds like your classes are very consistent. Like you're getting, you know, you're describing the majority of your classes producing a really good sound, mm -hmm. and that, that that sounds really great. Um, so. Um, were there any surprises when you use this when with everything we talked about um results of it the way it panned out in reality well i would yeah i you know i expected when i was i was teaching some of these concepts to my older students too and and there there's that fear of change they uh -huh. they thought the lead pipe was like why are we doing this why are we not working on all state why are we not working on our, our, our technique or double tonguing or whatever? Why are we doing this simple exercise? And, you know, and trying to convince them mm -hmm. like, Hey, this is, this is why, you know, and I had to explain to get more detail. Like this is our goal. This is, mm -hmm. this is the point of the exercise. They were uh, more hesitant to try it out mm -hmm. and then the, then the younger students, but the newer, I mean, the further I've gone along is that I've integrated it a little slower. I was kind of all in at first, Let's yep. do all these things, and they're like, oh, "I want to, I want to work on harder stuff than this." And you yeah. know, they didn't want to take that step back. Even at the high school level, did you see changes in their sounds and all this? Yes, um, especially with one student in particular. He's um, he he he's an overthinker, <laughs> and he would overanalyze every little detail about his sound and embouchure and and what. And so we started working on these these expanding the expanding mm -hmm. long tones. And we would start, he would mm -hmm. always have inconsistencies in the upper register. He mm -hmm. could play mm -hmm. and play with a good sound, but it was always hit or miss. Mm -hmm. And so we started on these descending slurs. We would do descending scales too. Mm -hmm. And it's become more accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, he had weird, weird, not a double buzz, but like a, a, a an extra vibration coming from his armature in the sound uh, that disappeared. Disappeared? Yeah. We just followed that free sound for blowing sound starting in the upper register and again a good full lower register and all of that all of those little inconsistencies have worked themselves out and are almost gone i found that too and to describe that might sound a little bit crazy <laughs> that's yeah. how when you get the sound going which is why it's a number one priority and you know this way of thinking or mm -hmm. the way you know I, w I was taught to do things but you find that oftentimes there's a weird little problem and um you know, my teacher's teacher believed um, at Indiana University he could fix like basically almost any problem just through the sound, working the student through the sound. Right. And you found that 
so they're struggling with something and the answer is usually getting them to sound good, right? Yes. Focusing on the sound, focusing on, you know, on every, every note and, and simplifying the routine. If, if it can be simple, you can do it well, then you can expand that to everything else. That you, find. Need. you find that this is a very simple way of approaching it for a beginner, right? Yes. You say that this would seem very like if you are the beginner and all you're having to do is play back and forth mm -hmm. and would you say that you know this is probably a little bit more of a simple way to approach it it's very it's very simple now i will say you know with that if if a teacher who's not a brass player mm -hmm. is applying this it's going to be more difficult yeah because there's so i mean like with, with me and you there's subtleties that kids do or, or things we are, we're automatically geared to look for that mm -hmm. we can address as a more natural process. But someone who's a, 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 a flute, you know, a clarinet player, a flute yeah. player, they're gonna, or percussionist, they're gonna have a harder time if they don't know just the, the mechanics of, of brass amateurs as well as we would. Yeah, yeah. Um, I find myself, I mean, I'm not sure if you do it the same way, but I find myself, you know, instead of, you know, I'm trying to fix their face or something to look right, it mm -hmm. seems like first we establish that, you know, you play with a good sound, they know what a good sound is. And then it becomes, you know, they play. And then you, for me, I find myself asking now, was that actually the sound we were going for? And the awareness, wouldn't you say that the awareness is another part? I mean, not just saying, hey, play with a good sound once, but then the awareness part sometimes takes time, would you say? Yeah, it, it takes time. It works into it because it is, is one of those beginner, especially with the beginners, the beginner faces, they'll, they'll start off great when you remind them, you know, the be set, think about what the sound is for the first note, think about how you want it to sound. And then their brains get kicked into high gear, worrying about everything else that's coming up in a line or piece of music. And then they, they start sounding bad and they, they think that, oh my gosh, we ended so bad. I'm like, well, what did you do? <laughs> what, what was wrong with it? How did it sound? Oh yeah, that's right. We didn't right. do X, Y, Z at the end. Like, yeah, you know, it, it's always, but it's always a guiding, the guiding part. You know, I found that and sometimes you can get them to sound good and then you do that and then they take a step back and you hear them in a lesson. <laughs> I find myself getting onto them a lot about that. You know, it's, mm -hmm. you know, I've seen one approach where there's a lot of time talking about, you know, your your chin isn't right <laughs> i find myself really getting on to them about now was that actually how you want it to sound <laughs> right i had that conversation with a student today before the before our phone call we were going through just just some fun sight reading um tunes he he's almost he almost made all state this year he's a great sound yeah um and he was sounding just off i'm like what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> you're not on Christmas break yet. That's not how you're supposed to sound. Try that again. <laughs> yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so you had your students play in the water, the young students. And of course, that's not like a major stapling philosophy of what, you know, yeah. but it's a fun thing. And so you said that it was fun for the younger students to do that. Yeah, they did. They, they loved it. Uh, we were, we were doing that pretty much once every other week last year. I yeah. haven't, haven't brought that out quite this year yet. Um, but they liked it and, and they're all with their seventh graders now and yeah. they, they, they just play full all the time. Yeah. You know, they, they bring it up. Hey, can we do the water bucket thing? And they're in the middle of band class. They have a different band director than me. And they're like, can we, Mr. Peacock, can we do this water thing? Like not now, but <laughs> they enjoyed it, but it was a good visual. It was a good, visual. It was a good uh, visual. showing them what type of airstream, mm -hmm. how it had to flow to produce a full sound. And you see like, you know, the bubbles will go and then they'll stop. Yes. And they'll go and you can show them that then, do you see that the airstream isn't consistent it's stopping in here yes and there was another thing that i found uh, i can't remember where i found it i think um i saw it somewhere but it was you you do a ping pong ball on the end of the mouthpiece oh i've seen that yeah i've yeah, not yeah. used that but that's that's good you turn the mouthpiece around but it works on the same idea of that consistent airstream now you can't you can't put the same amount of air mm -hmm. i found you can't put the same amount of air as you would in a bucket of water but the idea of a consistent airstream is still, mm -hmm. still good. 
So yeah, one thing I was going to go back to when you're focusing on the sound, did mm -hmm. you find that that approach? Um, and of course, you know, some people might say if people become obsessive about sound, especially trumpet players and it becomes counterproductive. I've got that point. But would you say that generally, you know, the focusing on a good sound and once you got students having a good tone quality that that did impact their range too, that was a good helper for their range? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's very prevalent right now, like I said, with the sixth graders, because they're producing, they're, they'll accidentally produce the fourth partial, <laughs> you know, or, or, and the same thing is true with the seventh graders and eighth graders, they'll yeah. you know, we address those issues, mm -hmm. they, they find higher notes popping out by accident. Yep, find that. They're not, they're not as scared of that, they don't think of them in terms of, oh, that's a high note. Yep. They think, oh, I, I played a high note, okay, mm -hmm. cool. And it, and it happens pretty often with this, I found um, it's a lot of fun teaching beginner trumpet this way. Would you say that as a teacher, you found yourself having a lot more joy sometimes? And I mean, I, I knew you, you were a great teacher. Would you find like with some of these things that someday you walk away from that teacher high when you got the whole class sounding really good? Oh, absolutely. Especially with beginners. I, I love teaching the sixth graders because of that same reason. It, they, they give their, they're so eager Mm -hmm. and they that and most of the kids most of the kids in my experience at that age want to do what the teacher says mm -hmm. uh, if they if they enjoy band mm -hmm. and it's really easy to get that teacher high from those especially mm -hmm. with those good days when they they sound great and they know they sound good and uh, yeah I would agree with that and then would you say that so when you started classes this way in sixth grade then what impact did it make in seventh grade and eighth grade in terms of laying the foundation and how they could they could you know accelerate from there right okay well um let's see with well okay so i, I spend a lot less time now addressing um i don't know how to say it, other than like puny trumpet sounds yeah you know you hear i hear all the parts all the time Mm -hmm. Now, I, I guess and present, anybody could say they could take a say, oh, well, if you would, you know, that could be any method. Mm -hmm. That could be anybody saying that, right, for any, any approach. But for me, it has really helped um, across the board make it a very consistent sound from person to person. Mm -hmm. And that, that's one of the, the depth of sound is what I've, in, I've noticed the most. It's awesome. Um, yeah, go ahead. And then um, would you say that when your students are sounding really good, that even in year two and three and four impacts like their intonation like they mm -hmm. well I, I get those comments from the high school teachers that have had the students both in private lessons and the, and the freshmen they just they say the trumpet section is the most consistent in the band that's awesome it sounds like your trumpet sections your <laughs> your strong section you're really strong well, they, i mean yeah i mean you know give or take some abilities and some sight reading but as far as sound they're 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 golden so <laughs> That is awesome. That is awesome. So yeah, um, any other things you would like to add? Um, no, it, it, not really, but it, it's, it's, it was worthwhile the approach to take mm -hmm. uh, to make a change. Mm -hmm. It fits in with a lot of philosophies people already have. Mm -hmm. For sure. It, it's not something that's strange. It's not new. <laughs> it, it's not, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to call out any specific yeah. pedagogues out there, but there are some very off the wall things that people do and people teach. Uh, but it fits in with a lot of people's philosophies and that and beliefs that they have in, in Texas mm -hmm. and around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just um, it's taking a step back and and really really working on that sound, like you said, guiding the form. Mm -hmm. um, would you I, say? Go ahead. When we are focusing on the sound, I mean, what would you say to someone who? feels like if they don't set up the embouchure with all of its characteristics right away, if we're not detailed with that, it's not correct, you don't get it right. I mean, because the responses that I've gotten is I think there's people are very skeptical. <laughs> they, yeah. mm -hmm. What would you say to someone who would feel like if they don't set up the embouchure with all its characteristics right away that it's, it's not correct? Well, I, I mean, I would say, okay, I mean, do they sound how you want them to? Mm -hmm. Do they, yep. if they have the sound you're looking your concept that you want yep i have to say my dog is <laughs> something, so sorry uh, uh i would say you know is there is the sound there you want if the sound is there you want then don't then leave it alone 
Yeah. If you're not happy with their sounds, then that's when I would say, okay, then let's look at what we're doing. Uh, how are you approaching Amishers? How are you approaching the concept? Mm -hmm. You know, have you, have you thought about, you know, bringing somebody in, if you're not a trumpet player, can you bring somebody in to help you get your class started? Yep. You know, that kind of thing. I, I would, I would aim, you know, are you happy with your results that you're getting? And if you're not, well then, then try something new. It's about the end result, right? The whole thing is, and this was this whole method, or I don't even know if you'd call it a method, but what I was learning, you know, it was all about the end result and it might surprise some people that a lot of it's based on science of how the sound works and it goes very deep in terms of psychology and how yeah. you would say that human beings perform at a higher level once they're not bombarded with lots of thoughts, like managing the embouchure. And like, if you have five traits of a textbook embouchure, you say that's quite a bit for a beginner. And do you say that, do you feel that they're a little bit more free, like to play well, yeah, when they have less to manage? Right. Yeah. There's less demands on their brain thinking about each individual step and they've learned, mm -hmm. they've learned how to, just breathe and blow mm -hmm. and things just work. They work. Yeah, they work. They, I mean, they've been given initial setup. It's always takes initial work, especially with the class to, on depending on different sizes, mm -hmm. but you know, they experience that freer, you know, they're free to focus on other things. They're free mm -hmm. to focus on, well, am I sounding like I'm supposed to, am I, am I articulating the correct way? You know, the, instead of saying, well, I got this here and a, a chin's flat and, corners are set and now I'm ready. No, they're not thinking about that. They're just doing a lot faster, a lot faster than the past. Yeah. I played trumpet for around 20 years now and I, I can't do that. So right. I always thought, man, beginners, that's a lot to manage because I know I can't do it. But right. um, yeah. Um, let's see the next thing. So you would say that when you use this, it could be common that in you'd have an 80 or 90% success rate in, in a class where 80 or 90% of the students would have good tone qualities. And do you think that would be reasonable or something that you would think could happen? Yes. Yeah. And, and it's given the avenue to get that 80%. Like right now I have about 15, I have 16 in the class. And I would say that all are producing characteristic sounds, but two. Yeah. But two. That's so cool. you might be a little, yeah. And that's, and that's the best, that's the best I've had. Mm -hmm. You know, and and the two that don't have physical reasons why they cannot, there is something else happening. They either have a mouthful of metal, yeah, braces, you know, or there's other as another embouchure default that we're working around. Mm -hmm. But and the kids that have for a couple of years now, right? You say probably eighty or ninety percent on, you know, for what three years in a row now you've had. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I can go down the line in every class and. And they can play and it's same sound across mm -hmm. the board. And you've had some student successes. Um, you were telling me about, was it seventh and eighth graders? Yeah. So uh, with, with a few of my, well, with a few of my high school students, I've had, uh, I have a top 10 all-stater. Awesome. Uh, in the state. And, and with, with the middle school all-state band, I've had at least two trumpets in there every year. Awesome. Uh, this past year I had the first chair and the second chair. Awesome. That's great. <laughs> That's great. That sounds good. What grade was that? Eighth grade? Uh, yeah, the first year was actually a seventh grader. Yeah? Last year, yeah. The eighth grader was the, second, was the second year, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's really rewarding, and I found the reason why I got into it is, you know, <laughs> I watched these DVDs, watched this old man say what he was doing, and I can say that before you see it done, wouldn't you say that before you see it done, it's one thing, and then you try it, and right. then once it happens, it's... Right. Seeing yeah. it happen is different than the theoretical idea of it, right? Yeah, and and I've watched some of those same videos, and to, I mean to be honest, it was it was a lot for my brain to let go. Yeah. Of what I what I had to use what I was used to saying all the time. Mm -hmm. Like it's like no, don't don't talk. Just, <laughs> don't talk. Just have them do it again. You know, yeah. you play and then have them do it again. And uh, that was a lot at first because I'm so I'm used to feeling that feeling that silence in the lessons with some form of information and yep. it's a different kind of information they're getting. Right. It's a different kind of information, different right. part of the brain, the subconscious, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think is performed actions that are very similar to playing trumpet. I mean, it's like we think of this as a new thing, 
but the the way they they learned how to walk i mean that was all subconscious learning wow. how to walk all, all that so it's you know the inner game of tennis talks a lot about that and i was inspired a lot by that but i remember as a student um i had a really good i had a really good trumpet teacher mm-hmm. and there was, he would play and then he would be saying stuff and in my mind i'd be thinking just let me go i want to go i know what you're talking about <laughs> like i want to go and those times where you're just like you're playing back and forth mm-hmm. uh, you find that that's where i really made the most progress because i was able just to try it it was giving me lots of chances to try it mm-hmm. but then when you stop and explain things a lot of times that changes the whole like the time the way the time's used right right yeah yeah and we we have a part of that in our class every day and all the brass classes mm-hmm. where i'll Right now, I'm, even though they're, they're way past this, I still do one part of the lesson every day where I'm playing a G mm-hmm. and they're going to play it back. Mm-hmm. And we do a couple times each student and we'll pause mm-hmm. and, I, you know, they'll, they know it now that they say, okay, I need, to, I need to do this. Okay, okay, let's do it again. And I'll say, did you like that? Well, no. Why? <laughs> well, my sound was too close. And they are able to describe their sound a lot more in, yeah. in depth than years past and so yeah. then they, just, they learn just to to experiment with their own sound to get closer to what the ideal would be mm-hmm. and we are talking about when you stop and you know when we we talk to the students stop and talking would you find that you know because you're a very experienced teacher that there are some words that may make sense to us and may you find that they're completely true but the way that they register in students brains might there's a disconnect like one teacher I really respect said that the body doesn't understand English. <laughs> right. A disconnect. So have you found that, that sometimes something that might make complete sense, the wording of it just doesn't register in the brain? Yeah, it, it's, yeah, it makes sense to, makes sense to us because we've, we've gone through the process of yeah. getting to that, arriving to that point in our own brains. And, and, and I was doing that the other day and to something, I don't know what I was talking about. And, maybe it was rhythm mm-hmm. or something. And, and I got, and I had a couple kids that just didn't get it. I said, okay, well, I pointed to a kid that understood. I said, well, then you explain it to them. Yeah, yeah. And they, they said something that made no sense to me, whatever. Like, I, I don't yeah. know how they got that answer. Then the kids, oh yeah, I know what you mean now. And yeah. off they trot. Yep. Yep. So, that's so I, I like to use that with the, with the students and, and, you know, have them explain it to each other. Mm-hmm. that role model teaching that peer that role model that peer teaching also adds to this too where they can they can talk to each other in words that they understand mm-hmm. you found that um i'm sure you found that with your students it sounds like you have sections that are very solid and mm-hmm. it's to create a culture right where everyone shows up and this is how you sound have you found that certain that influences other certain students that just by sitting next to those students then they start to pick up on it uh well, it kind of has kind of been a gap in our learning with with the quarantine. <laughs> Trying to think, no. uh, yeah, you know, they 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 know what to do. They don't necessarily talk about it. It's just an expectation. You know, if someone sounds bad, they'll do the whole trumpet thing and they'll look down the line. <laughs> you know, and they'll say, "Don't do that. Don't do that again. <laughs> don't do that. We don't, we don't do that here." You know, that's great. That's great. That kind of, I mean, we have our own tradition. Somehow, this I don't know. How I'm. I'm, I'm not, I hope you don't mind me sharing this, but yeah. somehow this tradition formed where we have to watch at the beginning of every marching season when we're doing trumpet sectionals, we have to watch Trumpet Christmas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how they got started, but that, again, that's one of those things where they have to learn. We watch this every year, so <laughs> we don't sound like that, but we watch it. Yeah. I've, I've been too afraid that that would inspire, you know. Yeah, it, it hasn't inspired I, that that mentality, but it's just a nice thing to laugh at, so. But yeah, in terms of range with the expanding, the expanding mm-hmm. chromatics, I think we were doing, where they go gradually. They, right. for people that don't know what this is, like you start in the very middle of the instrument and then you're on every, everything you're playing, you're working just gradually in this way. So you right. get to this, and then on the next exercise, then you start and you do it again. And you find that you can do this over and over again. You don't really feel taxed on your chops mm-hmm. and would you say that that impacts the way like those exercises impact the range i found it works really well for me but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it it for me i found more or less it works for accuracy mm-hmm. 
and, and placement, there's a lot less cracking, yeah. a lot less starting on the wrong partial. Yeah. They're more, they're more aware. Because they're uh, starting on the same partials. Mm -hmm. Right. So they'll, and we'll do it starting on G, we'll do it starting on C. We won't expand as far sometimes, but they're just more aware. Mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, because it, it's, it's Remington based. It's that mm -hmm. idea of the chromatic ascending and descending. So yeah. people would understand, but, uh, but it, it helps them just be aware of what their embouchure is doing, what their sounds doing, mm -hmm. and how the notes are placed when they're playing. It, it's just it's, it's led to overall just more accuracy. Awesome. Uh, to be I had never thought of that, but that's interesting. And I found this the the method that I use. I don't even know if I'd call it a method, but it's very deep. Where the more I get into it, the more benefits I find with it. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, so many good things happen when you know focus on the sound and all that. So, anything else you'd like to add here? Um, well, I mean, this this works. It can be adapted to mm -hmm. the other brass instruments as well. I think it works just as well on on. Yeah. I don't teach the trombones and baritones yeah. at the beginner level, but uh, it does work well for tubas and French horns. To me, it's helps sure. again with the accuracy, with the overall just relaxed tone quality of of all the brass instruments. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've I enjoy it and the kids like it because they're successful. Awesome. That sounds great. And um, one more thing, if someone weren't a brass player, like if someone were a woodwind player who were teaching this, mm -hmm. what do you think would be a way in which they could have a good sound model, like a recording, a CD played through the speakers? Would Do you think that might be a way to go about it? Yeah, I think that'd be one way. You know, that that's always helpful to have those guiding, uh, guiding recordings, but I would encourage them to take the time and, and learn to do it themselves. It's, no. it's, not, um, it's not a complicated. Not complicated. Not complicated at all. And, you know, it, it, it might have the same effect it has on them as it has the students, is mm -hmm. helping them to be successful learning how to play with a full sound, a vibrant sound. Mm -hmm. You know, because the wood, the, to be honest, the woodwind players that I know that play trumpet sound like a typical, what you would think of as a typical beginner would sound, beginner. Yeah. Yeah, there's not there's that pinched nasally yeah. sound they're not open and free. So I think these concepts would be uh, very useful for um, teachers of, of all instruments to learn. I found that too, because you know, in the um, well, I I can't say that I've ever seen you know a band director like this learn it in this way. But with the students we work with, we found that these students produce sounds so easily on the beginner level mm -hmm. that I mean, some of these students are producing sound in one, two, and three days where it seems like it's just a very easy way to learn trumpet. Like on my YouTube channel, you might be able to see, I have um, examples of college students <laughs> learning how to play trumpet in one to two lessons they're producing a sound. So right. would you say though that the a, a beginner method that's been... Beginner method that what? The old fashioned beginner method, if I want to call it that, if we wanted to find it as, you know, you know, obsession with the embouchure and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that maybe it's made it harder for even like teachers to learn how to play the trumpet if they try to teach themselves this way, some of these concepts? Yeah, I mean, it, it, because it it just becomes ingrained and it and it's that kind of one of the things we were talking about earlier is that fear of change. Well, this sure. is how I was taught. I had a really good, I went to a really good college with a good edu music education program. This is how it is. Yeah. And it's that resistance to change, to try something new that won't hurt. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be adapted to any, any it could be worked in mm -hmm. into any, anybody's concepts. And mm -hmm. eventually with mine, it overtook what I, what I learned mm -hmm. is now how I teach it, but it could be worked in. Yeah. And um, it, uh, it just goes back to that fear of change, I think. Fear of change, yep. That, that's what it was for me. I mean, when I was learning this and um, I had to convince myself to give it a try. And, you know, it was after, for me, it was after three or four years of playing trumpet this way. It was yeah. the way that I played trumpet. But then when I started teaching it this way, I found, wow. I mean, I came to believe that the trumpet's just like stupidly easy to learn, but that's not the the reputation it has on the beginner level. I think the, the reputation of trumpet is that it's the scary instrument that, you know, is frightening to teach and, it's very difficult to get students to play well, but right. obviously I think it can be different. I think it can be easier. Right. Would you agree? I would agree. I would agree with that. And then, and, you know, teaching, you know, as long as I have, 
watching the kids that have done these types of concepts or have the sound naturally. Mm-hmm. You know, the, you're the, the, the first chairs that just get it and they've always got it and they've, they don't, there's no explanation for why they have, they have it. They just do it. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and watching them play and studying them, there's that, that freedom of sound that they produce from the beginning mm-hmm. that's allowed them to, I think, be as good as they are because they haven't had to struggle. There's no thinking mm-hmm. that they're doing. They're just, I'm just, I'm just, I just play. This is how I play. Mm-hmm. They don't think about the embouchure step by step. They don't think about the mechanics. They just mm-hmm. blow through the horn. And then and I think and I, that's what this method is doing. It's teaching them, teaching them that subconscious, the bringing together all the parts subconsciously mm-hmm. where they're blowing and not thinking they're just doing. They're just doing. Right. A lot sooner, a lot sooner than most students do. And then when they get older, it seems like we have to do less like, a, you know, they're able to manage their own playing better. They're able to like, they have a North star to guide towards, right? The right. Who, and you would find the students who play with really good sounds. Oftentimes, you know, every, every trumpet player has a rough day and everything, but you find that these students know how to manage their own playing. Mm-hmm. More. Right. And this uh, I, one of the older students that I taught this to, he the one with the Amish problems that was uh, we talked about earlier. He his when we adjusted some things, he was playing a little bit too much pressure into his top lip. Mm-hmm. But so we started adjusting it to where he's evening out the pressure. But I didn't talk about Amish. Or I didn't talk about anything. I just talked about you know, that feeling of evenness mm-hmm. and free blowing of the sound. And how does it sound? See, it sounds pinched up there. Mm-hmm. Do you hear that? Can you change that? And when he started listening to how he sounded when he held his horn a little bit further down on the angle, he's like, oh, that's what it sounds like. That's what it's supposed to sound like. And it freed up his lower register mm-hmm. and his his technique took off. That was the biggest surprise he had. And that goes along with it, right? Right, yeah. He, <laughs> he went from playing pretty well, pretty good um, articulation, but it was always a forced Mm-hmm. effort he was trying to make it work and he could make it work but it always sounded that just like come heck or high water he was going to make that come out yeah and now it's just this solo sound this great lead not lead trumpet but like this not orchestral just free-blowing mature sound he has and his mm-hmm. his all state went up i think he went up 10 10 chairs wow in a year and you know his his tone quality scores and the scale scores went up and it, it really helped because during the quarantine he we could have short zoom settings and he's like I'm, I'm real i'm messing with my like i'm meddling with my sound like when i have a bad day i know it's because i wasn't listening to my sound yep yep and that's you know i found with myself some days i don't feel great but then if i get the sound going then it works <laughs> yeah and then it works like we don't always feel great and um so yeah, there was a thought that my teacher had about one of the reasons why we approach it this way is that when the student can sound good, then they can guide themselves at a certain point. Mm-hmm. They can fix right. their problems because they can go back to the sound and find it. But you know, I have been to these trumpet pedagogues, some of them, you know, the very biggest uh, names that will, th- they will do a miracle for you in your 60 minute session where I find, yeah. whoa, like, you know, when I was 16, 17, going around in Dallas was like, whoa, that was a miracle. Three days later, it'd be gone. And the only way to fix it would be to pay him 60 bucks <laughs> to get it back. And it seems like this way I've had students who, I have watched them warm up when we were in an ensemble rehearsal. Mm-hmm. It didn't sound great. And then I noticed about two or three minutes later, they started to be able to fix their own sounds, which was great. Right. They could guide themselves. Like once they can guide their own sounds, they can start to fix their own problems. and it becomes a really good way to go about things. So I, I found that was one benefit of it. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I think that's about it. I thank you for, for doing this. Sure. Sure thing. Yeah. Good to talk to you. Good to talk to you. I will talk to you later. Anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, that's it. Again, um, it it's not, it, it seems scary, but, and it seems, <laughs> It's, it's one of those things that once you dive in and you start using this with your students, I mean, you're going to see positive results. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it, Jim. All right. Thanks. Bye. Have a good evening. All right. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.